Hello and welcome to this discussion, this online discussion part of the Geneva Peace Week organized by the Center for Civilians in Conflict on the topic of towards a stronger civilian dimension in great power conflict, exploring implications of hybrid warfare on civilian population and democratic governance. Some of you might wonder why we are talking about great power conflicts. Well, if you look at developments of conflicts since the the Cold War, we can identify several waves. The 1990s were full of hopes, and this decade was called the decade of peace dividend, where uh, global military expenditure decreased in 1998. That was the lowest year ever recorded, with 745 billion globally being um, spent on military expenditure. It was also the era of humanitarian intervention. With 9-11, the 2000s were characterized by the fight against terrorism, the rise of counterinsurgency warfare, and also the rise of global defense expenditure. The 2010 were characterized by the legacy of the 2000, as well as an injection of a more civilian conflict, especially due to the Arab Spring in countries like Yemen, Syria, or uh, Libya. Here, what we saw is a stabilization for the first half of the decade, but then a rise again since the mid 2000s. The 2020s are interesting because basically what we are witnessing is development in each of the areas that we've seen in the last 30 years, in addition to the return of great power politics with the increasing tension between the United States and China. 2019 was the highest uh, recorded uh, me global military expenditure since the end of the Cold War with a um, 1,917 billion being spent globally. So more than the double of the 1998 uh, uh, figure. So what we see these days is not just civilian conflicts, they are transnational, they could be local, there is the risk of great power conflicts. What we see also is uh, the emergence or the resurgence of present conflict like nagorno karabakh is demonstrated. In addition to that, the use of force has also evolved. Traditional kinetic use of force is still very much applied with new means. Democratization of technology has allowed non-state actors to weaponize civilian technology, think about drones, for instance, that are increasingly being weaponized by states and non-state actors alike, but also the use of non-kinetic uh, means that have to do with cyber operation, disinformation operation, and cognitive uh, warfare. So what we see in terms of the threat pictures and the conflict picture is that they are becoming much more hybrid, spreading across all dimensions of power, as well as the increasing use of surrogates by states and non-state actors that are using surrogates and proxies underground that could be human as well as technological. So if you look at this first picture, a very important dimension is to look at what is the impact on civilian, you know. And so today we have a very distinguished panel to discuss this uh, dimension of uh, the evolution of conflict. We have uh, Ms. Elizabeth Broad, uh, Burrow, sorry. Is, she is a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute where she focuses on how governments, business, and civil society can work together to strengthen countries. Uh, she also used to work at Control Risk. She is a former journalist and she frequently publishes in Foreign Policy, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, or the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. We also have Mr. Ivan Lawson, who is an associate fellow at the Royal United Services Institute, currently working with the Center for Civilians in Conflict as a consultant, working on the protection of civilian in hybrid conflict. He has been working for the ICRC, and he has also a very distinguished career in, in the British uh, military for more than 30 years. We also have Colonel uh, Masiriuk, uh, Victor Masiriuk, Deputy Head of the Military Law Unit of the Legal Department of the Ministry of Defense in uh, Ukraine. Uh, Colonel Masiriuk uh, 
has more than 20 years of experience working alongside the legal teams of military units and headquarters on tactical, operational, strategic, and political level. And finally, uh, Mr. Julien Theron, who has a PhD in political philosophy and the emergence of troubles in society. He works on the emergence of new forms of conflict, the structuration, connectivity, and possible political solution. He has worked with many think tanks as well as for French, EU, and UN institutions, and also teaches at the School for Advanced International and Political Studies at Sciences Po Paris. And myself, Jean-Marc Crickley, I'm Head of Global Risk and Resilience at the Geneva Center for uh, Security Policy. Previously, I was Assistant Professor at the Department of Defense Studies at King's College uh, London. So, Based on the small overview of development of, of conflict that we've seen since the end of the Cold War, I will ask each of you the same question, which is how do these development, what is your assessment of the impact of this development in warfare on a civilian population? So you have about seven minutes to answer this first round of question. So shall we start with Evan? Good, uh, good afternoon uh, from Hanoi. Um, I'm going to talk really just around what we mean uh, by hybrid and some of the things we are identifying in our research um, in Ukraine. Um, the label uh, became particularly vogue uh, after 2014, really, after the um, occupation of Crimea um, and um, Russian supported operations in the Donbass. Um, I think in part this was a reaction to an idea that there was something new here that the West had missed, that, um, that you know, there was a, a new form of warfare. Um, and as a consequence, academics, policymakers alike came up with multiple labels, um, you know, ambiguous warfare, grey zone warfare, threshold warfare, warfare, and even I've been reading in the last week uh, a book by David Kilcullen where he's introduced the term liminal warfare, which really only means threshold again. Ultimately, though, the aim of actors using these hybrid approaches is to achieve strategic outcomes while staying below the threshold of a response, often a, a military response. So, you know, a Western NATO perhaps led military response in the case of, of the Ukraine. The approaches, as has been suggested, utilize all levers of national power, the diplomatic, the informational, the military and the economic, often with a degree of obfuscation. Um, and, and uh, accompanied by active campaigns of disinformation. It's important, I think, to recognize that hybrid threats are delivered both often at the site of a conflict. Um, so in the, in the case study of, of, of Ukraine, you know, in the vicinity of the Donbass, but also across the whole of Ukraine and indeed you know, beyond Ukraine's borders. So we saw uh, interference in a referendum in the Netherlands um, on Ukraine's relationship with the EU. Now, there's a number of critiques of, of this whole business of, of hybrid warfare. Um, the first one, I think, is that there's nothing new here, that states have always used all of the levers of power in order to achieve uh, strategic objectives. However, I would argue that thinking about this has actually uh, enabled policymakers to move away from a, a bit of a focus, really, on a kind of peace-war dichotomy, you're either at peace or at war, and to, and to recognise there is this state of constant competition, effectively. Um, but that then links into, I think, the second major critique, which is that the concept is almost too broad to be meaningful. Um, you know, if everything is hybrid, what are the boundaries between statecraft and warfare? If everything is warfare, is there a risk of a militarized response and escalation? And I think we see some of that with the efforts uh, made to fit a number of different actors into this hybrid model, which was probably, I mean, originally was actually um, really about um, Hezbollah. Uh, the original label by Frank Hoffman in 2007 was, was about Hezbollah. But we now see uh, commentators trying to fit this you know, very broad model into China, North Korea, to Iran, to Russia, and to a, and to a range of actors. Indeed, Russia itself will, will use the label to describe actions by the West. There are multiple definitions, unsurprisingly, with such a broad concept, even within organizations, I've managed to find three so far in NATO. Um, but ultimately, it's really about the synchronized use of multiple instruments of power tailored to specific vulnerabilities uh, across the full spectrum of societal functions 
um, and ultimately to achieve uh, synergistic effects. And I think um, uh, the observation that I think Sean Mark made earlier on, that this has really gathered momentum as it's being enabled by technology and people's access to technology. In uh, the work we've, uh, we've started, um, looking at the situation in Ukraine, we've spotted um, so far a, a range of, of forms of hybrid threat. Um, but I, I'll, I'll pick on a few. We've seen um, information and narrative warfare. We've seen economic coercion. We've seen cyber attacks. We've seen political warfare. And we, of course, have seen uh, lawfare. And all of these quite often you know, operating together at the same time. So um, we'll, we'll see that in some of the examples. But this leads, I think, to a real concern about um, civilian harm, particularly in the form of psychological harm. And indeed, you know, it's worth recognizing that although you know, we're talking primarily about psychological harm, this may well have uh, physical uh, outcomes, such as uh, increased suicide rates and, and domestic violence in the home. Indeed, when we, we look at the information campaigns, they're essentially designed to exploit divisions uh, within society. Um, you know, in the case of, 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 of the East, um, it's about Russian speakers. Um, but there's also, we've seen campaigns uh, designed to, uh, to target a Hungarian minority. There's also a narrative around uh, so-called family values, uh, a sort of counter to uh, Western liberal values, um, you know, again, targeting um, people like the LGBT community. And of course, these all bring with them a risk of civilian harm because of violence uh, flaring up between uh, the, those groups. I think it's worth recognizing that these campaigns are delivered both by the mainstream media as well as social media. There is a tendency, I think, to focus on social media, but an awful lot of the mainstream media now picks its stories up uh, from uh, social media. And, and, and in the case of Ukraine, you know, there are some issues around the ownership of uh, some of that mainstream media. Economic coercion, you know, the, the, probably the most obvious one is the control of, of gas supplies and you know, clearly um, turning on and turning off gas supplies has the potential for civilian harm. But also, again, in this, you know, this way these things are designed to operate together can be linked to the cyber attacks which have taken place against the, um, against the power grid. Uh, and again, this loss of essential services is a form of civilian harm in itself, but there's also clearly a psychological impact. We have also seen the funding of uh, extreme political parties uh, and the capture of civil society organisations, all designed to increase and target social division. Um, Elizabeth will talk in much more detail, I'm sure, about what we should do about this, but I just want to make some immediate observations on what we are starting to think about uh, in the context of Ukraine. And I think the first thing is we've got to improve our own understanding um, of both the threat activities and their impact. I mean, you know, it's, it's easy for me to sit here and talk about psychological harm, but we don't have a real feel for the extent of that harm. I think we then need to think about wherever we can protecting and informing uh, the population. Um, and that links to things like ensuring a free media and civil society, improving cyber security. But then particularly for the military, we need to think about making sure we continue uh, to constrain the use of military force at risk civilian harm, but also keeping the population informed as to the steps being taken uh, to do that. Being prepared to challenge you know, false narratives with evidence where appropriate, such as um, false narratives around uh, civilian casualties being caused by Ukrainian action. And part of this really is maintaining a strong civil military dialogue, a really positive uh, engagement between the civilians and the military. In the longer term, I think you know, there are benefits in looking at these total defense models uh, that we see around the Nordic countries, the Baltic states, and, and actually spreading now, Singapore, uh, Georgia, you know, a number of these countries, which seek to bring the civil and the military defense aspects together. And I think also to develop a, a focus on uh, resilience, both infrastructure resilience, but also societal resilience. How do we make our societies uh, stronger? And uh, there, are, there are lessons from elsewhere in the world. Uh, and with that, I'll, 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 I'll pause and, and hand on uh, to the next speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Ewan. And for, for this insight, based on the experience in Ukraine, 
that are very much uh, insightful because you you provided us with a, a good picture of the different dimensions of power that are being here used to um, to for corrosion. My next question to you after the, the in, in the second one would be to develop more this concept of resilience, you know, and uh, this concept of total defense. I mean, what is the way for how can we uh, improve this? But um, let's move now to uh, Julien. You want to share your thoughts about uh, the original question, which is about development of conflict and impact on civilian. Hi, Jean-Marc. Uh, thank you for, for, for this invitation. Uh, yes, uh, I have to say that uh, I agree completely with your presentation on the history of uh, hybrid and how it came uh, uh, to us today. Uh, indeed, since the 19th century, uh, it has a war has uh, deeply evolved, centering more and more on the civilian population. Uh, it was a, a already a dimension before, but it was not a battlefield in itself. I have to say that the representation that we have of war is still deeply focused on the military, right? The army as a body ruled by a strict order and discipline, the uniforms, the uh, uh, tanks, weaponry, warplanes and warships. This is what we think about when we think about war. But as a matter of fact, uh, what we call today conventional warfare serves uh, as an essential deterrence tool against the other state's aggression and sometimes some non-state actors. But it is rarely used for a traditional war, if I may say, between peer or near peer adversaries. The Cold War has amplified two already existing phenomena. The war is not the prerogative of the states, and the states uh, tend to circumvent a direct confrontation between them. Both of these phenomena brought war on the rear. In plus of guerrillas uh, uh, in Asia, in Africa, Latin America, the dozen of years between uh, uh, 67 and 79 has seen a sharp rise in terrorism. Guerrillas uh, armed civilian movement turned into a, a, a more or less a, 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 a kind of uh, asymmetric army. Terrorism crosses the moral boundaries uh, to take civilian even as the main target to politically force the states. State powers also manipulated these two phenomena to confront by proxy and, and sometimes non-coercive methods like psychological operations and informational war. In our post-Cold War world, these phenomena have not only been reinforced, but the apparition of a broadly accessible new technology installed war within the population even deeper. Internet from social networks to the darknet, is a formidable tool of contact, mobilization, recruitment, but also control. Great powers competition replaced in time of peace, great powers violent conflicts by playing on the rear, below the threshold of violence. It doesn't mean that violent uh, armed conflicts have disappeared actually both indirect through proxies or directly between state powers, and we are seeing that today. It even means that <clears throat> state powers, in order to maximize their powers by trying to destabilize their opponents, eh, are actually eh, getting always closer to the brink of war, and sometimes even triggers it through insurgencies, structured armed movements in, in different countries, or their own and various military implications more or less frequent. Doing so, great power competition rising in, in, in intensity and great power conflict decreasing in methods. Blood the idea of war and peace is what Ewan was, was saying. It, now the idea of times and peace and times of war that we see usually in international law is, became, is becoming less clear. This is what our friend uh, Frank G. Hoffman, who introduced the concept of hybrid war, calls a messy middle. The convergence of groups means methods, not only nowadays, since these decades, uh, make the time of war and peace different, uh, more or less blurry, I mean, uh, but also the actors themselves. Uh, uh, state actors work with non-state actors and sometimes just have to influence support indirectly and 
the, the, the destabilization process will begin. It means also that uh, the, the role of the armies, of the traditional armies, switched, uh, like for uh, 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 assistance or deterrence or denial, zone control. This is a new role for the armies who have to interact with non-state actors and with also the population. And this is the role of the resilience Iwan was speaking about. On a broader picture, multiple worlds, regional powers trying to reach a global uh, uh, influence through a new synthesis of their minds in all their form, create a world where instability is really immediate. In this new world, obviously, war is still here. There is no real time of peace. War is, is really already in the society, at least as a potential. The civilian area has become the main battlefield with its own troubling, uh, troubling dynamics, instrumentalized sometimes by foreign states. It is right at the center of great power confrontation. The ways to protect it rem remains to be explored especially in an era of done playing international humanitarian law. Thank you, Julia. Uh, thank you for, for providing the, the, this big picture. Uh, but the current transformation of uh, conflict and highlighting how uh, the civilian dimension has become the main battlefield uh, for um, for aggressor. The, in the second one, I would like to, to, to develop uh, your argument about um, the civilians being the main, the main target and what is the future of this uh, development and what can we do to counter this? Okay, how can we enhance the protection of uh, civilians, uh, especially in a time where technology is becoming more and more important and also more and more intrusive at the individual uh, level? Uh, let's uh, now uh, move to uh, Colonel Masiluk. So, Victor, uh, could you share your uh, introductory remarks? Yeah. Good morning, to everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's it's my it's my pleasure. And uh, before I begin, I must to emphasize that today, even so, I am speaking from Ukrainian side. I do not I do not represent the opinions and policies of the Ministry of Defense or the Armed Forces of Ukraine. And I'm going to provide an independent perspective. As we all know, law at, at its basic level is designed to serve such objectives as justice, predictability, etc. But today, the very ends of international law are contested, making the law itself contestable and subject to, to sophisticated manipulation by entities such as the Russian Federation, Hamas, Hezbollah, and ISIS. That is why we speak about lawfare not purely as battlefield exploitation of the use of of the law of war during the armed conflict to internationally and domestically legitimize an opponent whose appreciation for legal compliance is higher. But we look at lawfare as a wide-ranging concept which runs horizontally through all historically recognized diplomatic, information, military, and economic instruments of national power. That is why there is a clear understanding that law has become a legitimate of sorts and there is increasing use of the law for strategic ends. This dynamic is often referred to as instrumentalization of the law. For example, the incident in the Kerch Strait in November 2018, or the so-called passportization phenomenon in Crimea and Donbass, the creation of facts on the ground here in bad faith to create a covering for legality to justify future unlawful action. As we can see, such entities as the Russian Federation trying to exploit the boundaries between legal regimes and blurring the meaning of the law itself, explo exploiting the exploitation that requires legal expertise plus strategic communications and coordination within governments to successfully counter. And the creation of the center of excellence is a partial but vital response to a to a persistent demand for developing all of government approach to maximize the use of law as an instrument of national power, to establish actual and perceived legitimacy, defend sovereign rights of Ukraine and close the impunity gap for the most serious human rights violations 
in the context of the armed conflict. In other words, Ukrainian state now needs a coherent concept, long-term strategy, applicable action plan, implementation mechanism, and educational and scientific institution, which will preserve and deliver continuity in knowledge, skills, and institutional memory. Thus, centers to tackle all the above mentioned challenges, not as a policy and decision maker, but rather as a facilitator to already established government and international institutions in their strive to adopt comprehensive all of government strategies to build and strengthen resilience in reaction to oppositional and at times abusive instrumentalization of law. In this instance, from my point of view, Ministry of Defense and the armed forces are to play a leading role in the center due to the fact that lawfare is a paramount national, regional, and global security concern. Analyzing challenges which Ukrainian state has been facing since the beginning of the conflict, it is possible to conclude that the center has to be designed for achieving the following six strategic objectives. First, enhancing synchronization of strategic lit litigation and national security operations with objective-driven analysis to identify the way of using law to achieve strategic objectives and apply good faith interpretation of international law. Second, ensuring that national security decision makers empower the legal experts within the system to give good faith interpretation of the law, even though their recommendations do not necessarily align completely with the policy objective that the policy makers have. Third, improving identification of legal vulnerabilities in order to build resiliency and strengthen democratic processes by utilizing effectively existing legal tools to achieve particular effects in the national security arena. Fourth, within the context of armed conflict and the Ukrainian armed forces, identifying law's multifaceted role as an operating domain as well as a tool that can help achieve desired effects and as a set of tools that can be used against it will help build resiliency and best take advantage of the full range of law power to best complement kinetic operations fifth facilitation of legal compliance on tactical and operational level by establishing strategic messaging mechanisms to inform domestic and international audience on the state compliance with the law and to identify the attempts of the opponents to distort the public perception of legitimacy. Six, establishing a built-in operational and tactical military command mechanism, which allows to document and transmit the evidence of the opponent's breach of law on a very low level of tactical operations to strategic level, to expose the, the type of inferior actions and to inform decision-making process. In conclusion of, of my introductory remarks, I have to say that the above-mentioned activities will allow to achieve coordination of efforts, strengthening strategic litigation and national security operations, greater communication activities, and capacity building for lawyers. This is pretty much it, what I wanted to say for the introductory remarks, and I'm open for further question and discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for bringing this uh, this legal aspect, and, and you mentioned this concept of lawfare, so the use of law in a way as a weapon. And uh, the question I will ask you in the, the second run is that you know when we think about law, especially applying in uh, in armed conflict, we have international humanitarian law, just uh, used in uh, in Bello and yours at Bello, so the law that regulates the the, the reasons to go uh, to war. Now we are actually weaponizing law. I mean, uh, what kind of potential danger do you see if we go down uh, this road? Let's move now to uh, Elizabeth for your introductory remarks. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And I thought it was uh, very appropriate that as uh, we are recording this, it's uh, uh, the day on which the Nobel Peace Prize will be announced. So. A very exciting day, and it's also John Lennon's 80th birthday, and uh, and it's this year. It's also 40 years since he was uh, killed, and I I thought uh, that's uh, also an appropriate day to record uh, this session. We all remember, uh, imagine all the people uh, living life in peace 
And uh, as he said, you may say I'm a dreamer. And in fact, uh, now it seems that, that uh, he was a dreamer because um, aggression between nat nation states is increasing again. And I think it's worth remembering when, when we talk about hybrid that there is nothing new about it. In 2014, as you and mentioned, uh, it became a buzzword again. And, and it was as if uh, uh, the Russian had, Russians had invented something new. Uh, they were merely recycling what had been used, what has been used in virtually every war, uh, going back to ancient Greece, which is you, may, you mix whatever capabilities you have, and that in, involves kinetic uh, means and involves non-kinetic means. And uh, I don't need to remind anybody that uh, the, the Trojan horse was very much a non-kinetic uh, tool, um, and uh, the uh, the other side mistook it for a, a sign of friendship, and we know how that worked out. So uh, it's it's really worth remembering that there is nothing new about hybrid warfare. It's just that the Russians are, are in Ukraine in particular, are using it very successfully. Then uh, it's it's also important to remember that um, essentially since uh, the, the Second World War, the use of traditional wars has decreased uh, quite significantly. So, so Eastern Ukraine and Crimea, that's an aberration from uh, um, a trend that we have seen since the end of, of World War II. Um, and why has, has uh, traditional war decreased? From my perspective, it has decreased because, um, and I, if, if I may refer to a fantastic book, it's called The Internationalists. It describes uh, the, the um, how traditional war has gone out of fashion, but uh, from my point of view has become unfashionable uh, simply because um, um, established countries uh, don't uh, don't want to be seen as engaging in unseemly actions. Of course, they have engaged in unseemly actions anyway, but, but territorial wars are, are not what uh, developed countries do, at least not against one another. And on top of that, it's very expensive and very messy to engage in kinetic um, uh, aggression against another country. And I think uh, uh, maybe Colonel Masluk will comment on this later, but uh, even though the Russians uh, have done it in Ukraine, it, it has been come at, a, at considerable expense to themselves. And uh, if we look at, for example, the countries that, that uh, the Soviet Union occupied after World War II, uh, winning them was messy, but occupying them and keeping them in the Russian or the Soviet sphere of influence was extremely expensive. And it's um, not in, in a country's interest to spend that sort of effort and money. So what do they do instead? Well, they engage in, in gray zone warfare, which is of which lawfare is one part. Uh, they try to weaken other countries by um, targeting their civil societies. And, and that's where the big developments are uh, currently uh, taking place. And you can innovate so much because it's uh, our, in liberal democracies, our civil societies are, are unprotected. We are uh, open societies. We trade internationally. We are not used to, as, as societies, to thinking about uh, nation state aggression against our countries. So we are essentially completely unprepared. And uh, I hope we discuss later what we can do about it. Uh, but I think that is the, the dilemma that liberal democracies face at the moment, that, that uh, of course nation states will keep competing uh, even when they don't use uh, kinetic means. And, and um, uh, the, the, the idea after the, the end of the Cold War that we would somehow live in peace ever after um, was simply mistaken. And what we're seeing now is not just Russian actions um, against other countries' civil societies, but Chinese actions. and. The fact is, or the reality is that, is that any country that wishes to weaken another country can use these means, and we don't know yet what, which countries will do so, and which means they will use, because it's, uh, they are only limited by uh, their imagination. So that means that, that, that we as liberal democracies have to think of ways in which governments and civil society and industry can work together to be better protect uh, our societies against uh, all these forms of aggression. And um, I'll finish here and um, look forward to questions later. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for highlighting inter an interesting point that we are very vulnerable because we are not used to that kind of 
uh, ways to to fight, and so the adversaries can innovate. And at the end, you mentioned uh, the fact that we need to have a kind of multi-stakeholder approach. You know, you need it's not just the, the, the business, the government, but also the private sector. And I would like you to to develop a bit more this point in in, in the, the the second round of questions. So now let's return to to even, and if you could develop more your points about resilience and total defense, please. Uh, thank you, Jean-Marc. Yes, um, I suspect Elizabeth will build on this um, as she has you know, written quite a lot about it. But um, looking firstly at total defence, there's, there's a number of different models out there um, between the Nordic states, the Baltic states. Uh, Singapore has quite an, an, an advanced model. And I think my first observation would be that you can't just pick one of these up and apply it to, you know, to a country. Um, they're very context specific. Um, they're very, um, you know, they, they have to be designed to suit uh, the particular context of the, of the state um, that, the, that they're, they're being used in. But what they are really about is bringing together the civilian and military aspects of security and defense in a much more joined up way um, than is perhaps the case. And, um, and, and strangely, in a way, I look at from a UK perspective, you know, a lot of the things that we ought to be doing now, we actually did in the Cold War. And then as part of the peace dividend, um, all of that stuff was um, uh, was kind of thrown away. So things like having a, a really good detailed understanding of our critical national infrastructure, you know, where, where all the key points were. Indeed, that's what they were called, the key points. Um, digitization of a critical national infrastructure means that is now inherently way more complex than it was then we probably don't have the records of what it was then let alone what it is now so you know there's a number of these things which we used to do uh, which we need to, to re-engage with i think and i think a big part of it is going to be bringing um society back into having a sense of you know its responsibility for uh, for national security i think you know certainly in a lot of western states there is a pattern that says well, I pay my taxes, the government, you do my security and defence. You know, I've, I've contracted out, I have no responsibility. Well, you know, as we see in cyber security and, and in the digital world, you know, every, every individual has a function to play. Every, uh, every denial of service attack you know, that's run by a botnet, you know, one of us has probably at some point had a, a, one of our computers hijacked for that purpose. So there's, you know, there's, there's got to be almost, I, I would go too far, but a revised social contract. That the civilian population needs to uh, contribute to national security, and that's not just um, you know us as, as citizens and individuals, but it's business, um, it's 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 industry, it's it's all sectors of society have got to you know to take their their part in this. So that's so that would really be my sort of starting point for where you start to think about how you would deliver this in practice. If I could just follow on on your point when you say that, I mean. Uh, um you know, we should bring back uh, not just individuals, but uh, but, but uh, companies in this new social contract. Um, yeah, you have a country like, for instance, uh, China, where uh, companies are uh, legally uh, obliged to to cooperate with the government if uh, for uh, purposes of national security. Don't you see that there might be also a uh, a risk that we are increasingly secret securitizing state to just uh, answer this small question and then we'll uh we'll move to julian yes i mean clearly clearly there's a risk um but you know it's not about um it's about engaging rather than tasking so it's it's you, know, you, you can't talk about cyber security which is a key um, uh, a key aspect in countering hybrid threats without engaging the private sector um, and, and it is my view that this is not being done terribly well in, in, a lot of, uh, in a lot of states at the moment. I mean, China is clearly at the other end of that spectrum, where it's actually using businesses as, as, a, as, a, as a tool, as a weapon on occasion. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, to the point, uh, indeed, um, most European states, I believe, in the Cold War moved from conscription-based system towards professional armed forces. And what we've seen, uh, one of the consequences of this move is that the spirit that was uh, developed by 
you know, recruiting conscript from uh, the, the, the civil society in the military created uh, were part of this official contract. And maybe we have lost that. We have lost this soft aspect of uh, conscription uh, after the end of the Cold War. Julia, um, I pick up on your point of uh, the, the impact on, uh, on civilians. And I would like you to, to develop but the way forward, you know, about how, uh, from your perspective on the way conflicts develop, how could we uh, develop measures uh, to actually uh, make civilians uh, more secure in the future? How can we uh, prevent the civilians from, again, always being at the center of uh, conflict? Again, indeed, they have always been and, and they will always be, uh, I'm afraid. And in this respect, uh, I completely join Elizabeth's uh, presentation saying like, there's no materialistic approach of hybrid because there are roots in history and so on, even though today we are uh, converging into uh, uh, some kind of different, of different methods. Um, I also join uh, uh, Ewan when he says, when he speaks about a, a, a total war, because we are facing a, a second conceptualization of total war after Ludendorff's uh, uh, meaning that now uh, the, the civilian population is also not the, the target, but it's not only a dimension, it's also the actor. And I have to say that beyond hybrid, what is coming is the fact that the population itself, it's his own turmoil in a way. Uh, uh, so we could say that it's uh, on the side of great power competition, but actually it is not because they can manipulate these own uh, uh, self-propelled uh, 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 civilian movement. So this is uh, definitely a risk. So I would say that uh, resilience is definitely important, resilience of the population, uh, but resilience is also turned toward acceptation. So uh, resilience, for instance, is very important not to create this kind of self-propelled uh, uh, destabiliz destabilizing movement inside the society uh, in terms of a, a counter-terrorism, for instance. Although I think that what we are facing and this convergence of risks uh, needs to be addressed by a more dynamic defense and a potential response as well, uh, including to protect from uh, disinformation and propaganda, for instance. In this respect, uh, uh, I think that there are few major elements that we have to understand. The first one is the unicity of security guidance. Uh, a, a lot of different security-oriented institutions within the state usually advise uh, different elements just because of bureaucratic dynamism, right? But uh, the diversity of advice, of views, and so on, sometimes create uh, mild uh, answers, and that are not that efficient. The second element is the strategic ability of the decision-making process. Uh, meaning the ability to enforce a clear and strong answer uh, at the national level, but also, and that's uh, uh, increasingly important, I think, uh, into collective defense uh, uh, regional organizations. Uh, so uh, this is quite important. A little bit below, we also need to address it with the huge homogeneity uh, in the uh, implementation of the answer from an institutional point of view, not only from different state institutions, but also from different states by themselves and regional organization, which is really hard for all the reasons we know in terms of uh, institutionalism. Uh, but uh, it is important to act collectively uh, between the states, and it is important to act also the state with the private actors, the society themselves. Iwan was referring with the, with the business actors, for instance, uh, which is tremendously important indeed. Uh, but this is important because if we concentrate only on the state, we, have, we play the danger to overplay its role and then uh, to, to have a securitization process that might uh, uh, play the role not of security, but at least the impression of insecurity, and this is also playing a role within the social movements uh, that I was talking about. Uh, in this respect, perhaps three uh, small uh, elements, uh, uh, food for thoughts, that uh, uh, might be interesting. The role of the army has to be reinvented. It is not the ultimate, uh, 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 how could I say, actor of uh, uh, broad security. Uh, but it is definitely something that has to be 
reinvented at the strategic, operative, and tactical levels, and also within the link with uh, the nation and uh, the private actors. Second element, the role of the population, but the active role of the population, not at only as an acceptance. Uh, actually, the Baltic countries, the Nordic countries, uh, uh, play uh, on that a lot uh, uh, in Ukraine uh, as well. Uh, so this is quite important. And the population has to act and react collectively with a sense of solidarity and patriotism, which is somehow, sometimes, missing, especially in liberal individualistic uh, societies. Uh, third element uh, uh, that we might think about, the uh, underplayed role of education, uh, especially in terms of information. We, nobody knows how to inform itself, himself, and that, that's quite important. But also in terms of risks, both in terms of the methods threatening the society and uh, the actors playing these kind of methods, uh, and finally, also uh, as a response, uh, and once again, uh, the people who are exposed uh, the most to hybrid warfare uh, are a tremendously interesting example in, in this respect. Thank you, Jamal. Th thank you for highlighting just the new, well, the new roles of the armed forces, but also the, the, the importance of regional organization. And uh, that, that cannot be done only on, uh, by states alone. The problem is that we see also a fragmentation in terms of interests among states and the role of uh, regional organization is also increasingly uh, challenged these days. Uh, Victor, would you like to address this issue of the weaponization of law? Is it what is the purpose of law and what might be the dangers of going down that road? Well, thank you very much for the question. Let me clarify a little bit. Uh, prominent American Air Force lawyer and later General Officer Charles Dunlop in his seminal 2001 article launched the term lawfare as a use of law as a weapon of war as well as a method of lawfare where law is used as a means of realizing a military objective. According to Dunlop, it means actual orchestration of situations to deliberately expose non-combatants to enemy targeting in order to either immunize targets or more frequently to propagandize the resulting injuries in order to erode the warring opponent's legitimacy and hence international and domestic support. In this context, lawfare defense mean defining and practicing effective countermeasures within legal domain, which call both the, to protect civilians in armed conflict and to deprive perpetrators of IHL a legal ground for conducting a lawfare. To be honest, lawfare defense is a broader concept which consists of legal support for protection of civilians and in a wider context, a legal tool for national security sector. Here we, can, we come to a reason why we speak about center of excellency simultaneously for both protection of civilians and lawfare. Let me give you a practical example on how protection of civilians and lawfare work together. On September the 2nd, 2020, the government of Ukraine passed a resolution 767 on the payment of financial support or reparations to the persons who lost their lodging due to the military aggression of the Russian Federation. In accordance with this regulation, government of Ukraine establishes the mechanism of estimation of the cost of damage or destruction of housing of the victims of Russian aggression and procedure of a decision making and actual payment for the damage of destruction. I will not go too much into detail of this legal paper, but I would like to emphasize two important, from my point of view, issues. The first, is that representatives of the armed forces of Ukraine are to participate in the commission on examination of damage or destroying housing. housing. This fact stresses on the importance of military expertise in the process of reparation payment. And second, and maybe more important aspect of the above mentioned regulation, is that payment of monetary compensation to victims is an integral part of the formation of the Ukraine's consolidated claim to the Russian Federation on the implementation of its international legal responsibility for armed aggression against Ukraine. So the whole cycle of paying reparations and charging aggressor state and its affiliates serves the following purposes, which are mutually interlinked and inherently inseparable. Firstly, 
assuring protection of civilians in armed conflict. Secondly, preserving integrity for victims and punishment for perpetrators. And lastly, preventing violation of international and domestic law by closing impunity gap. In other words, if our adversaries such as Russia, Russia Federation use law as a weapon of war, our task is to practice effective countermeasures in the, in the legal domain. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this clarification about how Lofer can use both offensively and as well as defensively. Uh, Elizabeth, um, you are very much you have very much expertise in resilience, and you uh, you uh, came up or you, you talked about multi-stakeholders approach. Could you actually try to combine the two to explain how a um, future concept of resilience actually could build upon this uh, multi-stakeholder approach? Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Um, so I think that the fundamental shift that, that, that needs to happen, and in fact is already happening, is to, for governments to begin thinking of uh, societies as uh, not as, as um, sort of a passive entity that needs to, uh, just needs to be protected, but as a resource in, in national security. And as you had mentioned, in, in many countries, uh, the approach, at least for the, the past 30 years, has been that, oh, I pay my taxes, somebody else should take care of national security. And in fact, uh, that has worked for the past 30 years and, 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 and in some cases longer because there hasn't really been uh, much need for the rest of us to, to, to participate um, in keeping our countries safe. Our countries safe. Um, but it's, it's, I think, obvious to everybody that when aggression against our countries involved not just uh, other countries' armed forces, but but a range of um, uh, subversive activities that uh, can and does they can and do affect every single one of us. Then it, it's it stands to reason that every single one of us can be involved in keeping ourselves safe and keeping our families safe and our and our communities safe. And so, uh, what's happened recently is that countries have begun thinking of. Uh, uh, returning to military service, which I think is um, is just completely the wrong approach. Uh, there are a couple of models, or a, a model in particular, uh, that, that works really well, which is the, the model that the Norwegians have developed, where the armed forces select uh, a small percentage of, of each year group for service in the armed forces, and that means that they get the best and the brightest, and they don't need to, to uh, deal with with the enormous numbers that armed forces had to deal with during the Cold War in most countries, and uh, those numbers included a lot of people who didn't want to be there, a lot of people who were unsuited for military service, and that benefits nobody, least of all national security. Um, but what it also meant was that uh, those people, in, in, which were almost always men, got a sense. Um, or learned that they had a role to play in national security. And I think that's what we need to, to instill today in, in people young and old, that they can play a role in national security. And, uh, but that role doesn't have to be uh, in the armed forces. In fact, the armed forces uh, should, uh, well, as I mentioned, only need a, a small share of, uh, of uh, teenagers in any year group. And, and then they clearly don't need the rest of us to have let's say, um, past the age of 19, they don't need us to be involved, but where we can be involved is in resilience, in knowing what to do during, in, um, during crisis, and knowing what to do before a crisis. And this is nothing new, that's something that, that uh, many countries, uh, including the Scandinavian ones, focused on during the Cold War, in, in, in that total defense models. Of course, those total defense models were based on, on an assumption of, of, of an armed invasion, but, uh, the role of, of the ordinary citizen was not in, in, in sort of taking up arms. That was just for people who had been trained to do so. But everybody had a role to play, even if it just meant uh, knowing um, uh, how, which information to trust, knowing what to do if, uh, if uh, food supplies were cut short and so forth. And these are skills that we can learn again, because they apply to um, cyber attacks as well, to disruption of supply chains, uh, to disinformation, the sort of things 
gray zone aggression, a gray zone forms of aggression that, that we are likely to face and are already facing. And um, so, for example, one um, model that, that I think would work very well, very well simply because I, I, I thought of that myself, is resilience training for teenagers, um, where they would get uh, to participate on a voluntary basis in resilience training uh, before graduating from secondary school, and they would then be a resource to to blue light uh, services in their countries, and that would mean that blue light services would then be less stretched, and indeed the armed forces would be less stretched, because as it is, the armed forces are often called upon to, to, to assist civilian authorities when, when uh, they are stretched, which has happened in many countries uh, during the coronavirus pandemic, when armed forces had to, to drive uh, up and down uh, their countries to, to deliver supplies. Well, that's something that civilian authorities can do if they are assisted in, in more basic task, tasks by, by ordinary, uh, ordinary citizens who should, of course, be trained. So the, the basic point, or the, 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 the fundamental point, is that the population is a resource and it's, it's just up to the government to, to, um, to communicate that, that everybody um, has the ability and, and, and indeed uh, well, has the ability to contribute to the national well-being and the well-being of his or her community and, and his, or own, uh, his or her own family and not just uh, um, when, when a crisis occurs but ahead of it so that we can communicate to our adversaries that we are prepared and that there, it makes little sense or that it, it would just not be very effective to, to try to, to uh, target our civil societies. Thank you. So what I take from that is that you're arguing for a very holistic view of the role of uh, uh, citizens in, in total defense, that it should not be at, uh, at all just focused on the military, but looking at a provision of uh, civilian uh, services. And maybe also, uh, this is an area that we haven't talked much, is also the role of education for uh, developing such system. As we are uh, sl slowly uh, drawing to a close of, uh, for this workshop, we still have a few minutes left and this uh, uh, discussion has been organized by the Center for Civilians and Conflict. I would like to give the floor actually to the representative of the Center for Civilians and Conflict uh, for uh, any uh, remarks or questions they might have. Beatrice, would you like to take the floor? Sure, thank you Jean-Marc and thank you to all the panelists for their uh, amazing contributions this morning. Um, actually, uh, just a remark and a question, if, if you allow me, if we have time, Jean-Marc. Um, the, the remark is to contextualize this conversation. Um, why we started to, to delve into this question at Civic was, of course, because of what we observe in Ukraine being, you know, engaging closely with the military and civilians uh, in the Donbass region. So it's a very practical conversation. And at the same time, being also um, in, in, in direct contact and engagement with uh, militaries across the world, including, um, you know, NATO in the UK and elsewhere, what we notice is uh, as they are um, getting prepared to this great power confrontation, whether kinetic or not kinetic, they, they tend to uh, forget some of the lessons learned from uh, the previous years. And uh, you mentioned very well, Jean-Marc, that in the previous uh, uh, decades, the, the focus was on counterinsurgency operations and then civilian populations were very much at the center, I think, after uh, years, uh, militaries learned the lessons la from Afghanistan and Iraq that, uh, that that's, um, somehow they needed to win the hearts and minds of the population, that there was a strategic added value to better protect its civilian, in addition, of course, to the legal and ethical reasons to do that. And as we engaged on how they are preparing or getting prepared for large-scale war fighting operations, um, somehow there is a Chinese war between these two um, different um, uh, options, meaning that uh, somehow this disappears and we're getting back to the populations being, you need to get them out of the way, but there's basically um, uh, the, the strategic added value of better protecting civilians is a little bit more marginal, I would say. And, and I think what we have heard today and it's been very eloquently said by all the speakers is um, 
And I think some of you, one of you said, the civilians are a battlefield. Uh, so basically, they are basically at the center of the equation in great power conflict, whether kinetic or non-kinetic. And, and all the different modalities of, uh, um, um, let's say, uh, or tactics, or hybrid tactics that have been described by the panelists actually show how much of an impact this can have on civilians. And you know, at Civic, we're looking at a conflict situations. So we're looking at how these uh, non-kinetic uh, tactics impact the, the civilian uh, harm in environments where they're already affected by um, physically actually and very directly by the conflict. Um, so trying to explore a little bit these synergies. And um, so the question I have actually maybe for you and for other panelists is, could you delve a little bit more into how in the context of a conflict, um, how this interaction between um, kinetic and let's say uh, kinetic and non-kinetic uh, um, tactics impact civilians. I'm thinking, for instance, uh, about manipulation of information on civilian casualties and how this can impact uh, the, the potentiality for increased civilian harm or increased tensions between civilians and militaries, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe if one of you could, in a very concrete way, explore a little bit this, um, this dimension of, of, of how um, 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 uh, the two dimensions, kinetic and non-kinetic, relate to one another in a conflict area. Thank you. Thanks, Beatrice. So one, do you want to, to pick up on that? And then we, we go around to, to consult all the different uh, panelists. Yes, thank you. Um, I mean, briefly, um, there are a number of you know, very practical ways you can see these things operating um, you know, together. Um, we have seen um, uh, mass use of text messaging to the families of Ukrainian soldiers, um, uh, literally tied to um, specific military activity. So, um, you know, hello, um, your son, daughter, wife, mother, whatever, is at location X. Um, in five minutes, it will be shelled. Um, we strongly recommend that you, you know, contact them and tell them to get out of the way. Um, the implications of that in terms of civilian harm um, are significant you know the, the the impact that has on families um whether that information is accurate or not the you know the implication that has on families is is significant um you know the idea that you we have seen you know, the deliberate use of um of civilians as human shields and, and you know, that can be you know, enabled by um false messages so um, you, know, you send a message um, as, as your, uh, the adversary sends a message saying, uh, please move to this location because um, you know, there's going to be conflict where you are now, but actually the conflict is where they're being moved to. Um, and therefore, the, the innocent party who doesn't realize this has happened ends up you know, injuring and killing civilians in, um, you know, because they didn't know they were there. Um, so there's a there's a set of um, there's a whole set of, sort of tactics that can be uh, applied here, um, but I think also we do need to think beyond that immediate battle and out into the wider society because I think that's in some ways where the per more pernicious uh, risks from um, from hybrid threats lie. Thank you, Julian. Yes, uh, <coughs> thank you, Jean-Marc. I think that what is important to understand is that. The civilian population is indeed a battlefield, but the civilian population is also an actor of its own battlefield, if I may say. Uh, meaning what? Meaning that uh, uh, if we did not understand in liberal democracies that uh, the population, like we were saying, uh, uh, is a, a, a not only a target, but also an actor of the security, uh, it means that we did not understand how modern warfare is, is made. Uh, in this respect, for instance, uh, uh, we can't imagine the population not creating itself trouble. Uh, what do I mean by that? Is uh, uh, the psyche of the population is uh, uh, some, an object of war. Uh, and if you control the psyche of the population as a, a fourth dimension uh, of warfare, well, then you can uh, control the population. And that's uh, exactly what we're talking about, population-centric warfares. In this respect, uh, we see that different methods are used to control and intoxicate, in a way, this psyche of population and to turn it against its own interest. That actually happens in different uh, uh, Western uh, uh, countries now. Uh, and that's a very important point 
for the uh, decision makers to take into account and to protect the population against an intoxication that would lead to its own, uh, if not destruction, or at least uh, uh, destabilization. Thanks, Victor. Yeah, I think from my point of view, the key word here is impunity <clears throat> from the legal perspective, I would say. For instance, those who uh, conduct military operations and commit war crimes at the same time, they, if they, they're not brought to justice, uh, it kind of sends the message to both the perpetrators of the IHL that uh, they can continue without being uh, uh, charged for their, for their war crimes. And obviously, there is a significant impact on civilian population from this point of view. And uh, for, 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 from, from civilians who observe and who suffer actually from those war crimes, um, as they kind of become uh, more aggressive towards the, the perpetrators, obviously, and it's really, it leads to escalation of the conflicts as a well. whole. Thanks. And last but not least, Elizabeth. Well, first of all, uh, the world. Uh, the Nobel Peace Prize has been awarded to the World Food Programme, which I think everybody can agree is good news. Um, it was just announced. So, uh, if I can just add to Ewan's excellent points, the, the use of the opportunities for deception uh, is a, a major change. So, if we think about deception of uh, not just of, of um, enemy armed forces, but of, of uh, the civilians in, in their country or in uh, the civilians um, represented by those armed forces. In the past, uh, it was essentially a matter of, of uh, throwing leaflets from airplanes and, um, and uh, during, uh, during World War II, up until World War II. And today, as you had mentioned, uh, that deception can be much more targeted, not just can be, is much more targeted. So you can contact um, uh, relatives of, of soldiers to, uh, incentivize them, uh, cheat them into uh, giving their sons and daughters and fathers uh, and husbands and wives uh, incorrect information. That is uh, very sneaky, but what are we going to do about it? It's uh, again exploiting uh, a vulnerability in our free and open societies and we should mention that that deception is not just directed against, um, against family members but against um, uh, armed forces personnel themselves. That was a, a fantastic reports um, by one of the uh, NATO institutions that looked at, I think it was uh, one of the NATO institutions that looked at um, how um, deception on social media could influence or uh, might influence um, soldiers that are part of, of enhanced forward presence in, in, in the Baltic states and in Poland. And actually the results were quite shocking. And again, this was exploiting, exploiting their activities in, in civilian life, as it, was, as it were, uh, their use of Facebook. And they were then fed uh, through Facebook incorrect information. Well, thank you for, for this. And uh, I think we could, we, could, we could continue talking about this issue, but it's already more than an hour uh, since we started this, uh, this, this conversation. So thank you very much for all of, uh, of you uh, for this uh, really, really rich discussions about um, the transformation of warfare and the impact it has on civilian uh, population, the way also to think about the future of how we can uh, better protect uh, civilian population. This is an issue that will uh, uh, not uh, disappear and uh, that will probably have the opportunity to talk more unfortunately in, in the future. So thank you for uh, having uh, followed this discussion and uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to continue such discussion uh, in the future in a future podcast or uh, presentation discussion at the Geneva Peace Week in New York Times. Thank you very much for joining us and for listening to what uh, we had to say. Thank you. Thank you very much.